Mr. Michael Rawling from the University of Technology, Sydney, appearing via teleconference. So for the Hansard record, if you could please give your name and state the capacity in which you appear. Yes, my name is Dr. Michael Rawling and I'm a senior lecturer in the Faculty of Law at UTS, Sydney, that's the University of Technology, Sydney. Now, Dr. Rawling, I would like you to make an opening statement. Normally I say brief, but I'm not going to say brief. I'm going to use the whole half hour really to hear from you because I did read your submission. There's not, I don't think you'll find anything I'll disagree with. Uh, and very, yep. very keen for you to share these words of wisdom. You have already done it on the website, but actually in person. Okay, uh, look, thanks, Senator Stell, and thank you for the opportunity to appear before this uh, Federal Senate Committee. I'm a legal expert, so I'm interested in the um, operation and impact of law and also the, the design of law. And in particular, I have a special focus on road transport workers. And I want to make five points in my um, in this statement to your committee. And once again, thank you. Um, so the first point I want to make is that I'm, I've formed the view over the last couple of years that there's a gap in the regulation and there needs to be a new federal workplace tribunal for the road transport industry. And um, that gap in the regulation has appeared after the abolition of the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal. And, there, and um, there's been a large gap in the pay, pay and safety regulation in the industry since the abolition of the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal. Now, I understand that your committee is looking at a number, a, a suite of strategies, and I recognise the importance of having a suite of strategies to address safety and standards in the road transport industry. But um, I think that as part of a suite of strategies, um, there needs to be workplace regulation, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain what form of workplace regulation I think is appropriate for the road transport industry. So that's the first point. I think that there needs to be new uh, federal regulation of the road transport industry. And I want to explain why. But this is the second, the second point. Why better regulation is needed? And um, I'm of the view that there's currently a pretty serious um, element of safety problems in the Australian road transport industry. And uh, I mean, other, other members of your committee and, and Senator Stirl would know this well, but the road transport industry is one of the most dangerous industries to work in in Australia, with Australian truck drivers 13 times more likely to die at work than ordinary Australian workers. And there is major safety risks, not only for those working in the industry, but as well for, uh, for everyday road users. After all, as, as you know, the workplace for road transport workers largely consists of public roads, which are used by the general public. And more than 800 people have been killed in heavy truck crashes since the abolition of the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal in April, April 2016. And I've gleaned those figures from Department of Infrastructure um, um, statistics. Um, so, um, yes, so uh, are you hearing me okay? Yes, yes, sorry, it was just me conferring uh, 800 there. Yes, we're hearing yeah, you perfectly. 800, yep. So that figure doesn't include um, people who have died in bus crashes. So there's also a, a, a number of uh, scores of people who have died in bus crashes um, since the abolition of the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal as well. On top of that figure of 800 people killed in heavy uh, truck crashes. And there's also, um, also in the road transport industry, there's also been um, delivery riders and drivers killed in 2020. And there's, but there was in, in the latter half of 2020, there was five gig workers killed uh, on Australian roads in that, in that six month period alone. Now, um, as I'm interested in um, legal measures to address these sort of issues, 
Um, it's interesting to see that some of these deaths were actually preventable and that a cost-benefit analysis commissioned by the Coalition Government found that there would have been around a 28% reduction in heavy vehicle crashes if the first two orders made by the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal were implemented. But as I said, that tribunal has been abolished. So that's the second point. The, the second point is the, um, the reason that I, I'm of the view that there's um, need for better regulation is the safety issues in the industry. The third point is about factors leading to poor safety in the road transport industry. There's a number of factors, but a key factor is underlying poor safety is, is low pay. And um, I just want to talk a little bit about the constitution of um, the workforce in the road transport industry to understand this and the applicable regulation. So there's, there's a, a large workforce of employee drivers in the road transport industry, but as, as the senators would know, there's also a large workforce of owner drivers who are engaged as contractors. Now, the, the key point about contractors, and I'll come to why I think this is inappropriate, the key point about contractors is they largely fall outside the protection of the minimum standards in um, federal legislation such as the Fair Work Act. Now, um, so there's this large workforce of owner drivers in the, road, in the Australian road transport industry, and that means that they lack any mandatory minimum rates or other standards. And I noticed that your committee, one of your terms of reference is minimum, minimum standards in the road transport industry. And this, so this is a key gap in regulation in my view. Um, a, a, a typical pay arrangement for those sort of workers is a per kilometre rate or a per load rate. In other words, um, piece rates. Now, um, owner drivers then, because they're, because they're paid per kilometre or per uh, load in some circumstances, owner drivers may have an incentive to drive faster and longer in order to earn an adequate wage. And this is, can be hazardous and can lead to deaths and other poor health and safety outcomes in the industry. So this is the nub of what the literature calls the link between um, pay and safety. Now, um, the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal was beginning to address this link, but as I said, that was unfortunately um, abolished. Now, over the last 30 years or so, there's been a steady decline in pay rates in real terms. That's established in the literature as well and low rates for contractor drivers place downward pressure on the pay of the employee drivers as well. And furthermore, it's not only, it's not only the minimum rate for per kilometre rate or the, um, or the low rate that's low, there's also poor working conditions which impact on low pay, such as being unpaid for a lot of working time for example, being unpaid for queuing, being unpaid for loading and unloading, <clears throat> and consequently, um, drivers are using rest breaks to load and unload, and causing drivers to become fatigued and possibly um, engaging in hazard, hazardous practice, hazardous practices on the road because they're fatigued. So that's the that's the third point I wanted to make. The third point is that low pay is a factor co contributing clearly established in, and I, I, I outlined some of the literature, but there's more literature since my submission, clearly outlining that low pay is a factor in contributing to poor safety on the, on the, on the roads. So the fourth point I want to make is about the on-demand gig economy in the road transport industry and how that's making matters worse. Um, now, this... So there's, there's, two, there's two main types of gig work in the road transport industry. One is, is crowd work. I'm not so much interested in that, but I'm interested in the on-demand gig economy work. And that's where um, um, riders and drivers 
uh, engaged by, through apps and platforms and the platforms manage the uh, engagement and the businesses behind those apps and platforms such as Uber are taken to be the work provider of the gig economy workers. That's really the arrangements that I'm talking about here, the on-demand um, gig economy. Now, with those workers in Australia, and, um, the, and as I understand it, that um, the, the senators may know, uh, uh, and researchers on the committee may know this better. But as I understand it, this economy is not a, is not now limited to food delivery work or um, Uber driving. But as I understand it, is is expanding into freight. Right. And yeah. Okay. Thank you, Senator. Um, so, um, these, with these workers, they're, they're being engaged as contractors again. And that means um, a lot of these workers in food delivery especially, but also in uh, Uber driving and that, um, there's, there's reports uh, and, and um, other information concern, um, confirming that they're earning below the minimum wage and working in hazardous conditions. Um, now, notably, the service being delivered um, by these workers and the labour performed by these gig workers is almost identical to the parallel, more traditional work arrangements in the road transport industry. So what I'm really saying here is that Uber drivers um, deliver the same service as a conventional cab driver, etc., and freight drivers deliver the same service as those um, more traditional, uh, engaged by more traditional arrangements who are delivering freight. So really, these workers need that. It's really a false kind of way to look at this work as being in a separate gig economy. These workers are really embedded in the road transport industry. They have the most similarities with other work performed by other road transport workers. And this reinforces one of the points that I make in my written submission that these gig economy arrangements should be covered by the same scheme of regulation. And what I'm proposing here is that the road transport industry have an industry-specific scheme of workplace regulation that covers all types of road transport workers. So that's the fifth point I want to make, and that is what sort of workplace regulation is needed because what I, what I said in it, when I opened my statement was that um, the, there really is a gap in the regulation. Um, there's, a, there's a need for workplace regulation in the road transport industry um, to uh, set standards and level the playing field so that it makes um, businesses sus sustainable in the road transport industry. Um, and that a suite of strategies should be considered, but one of the things that is needed is workplace reg regulation. And what I'm of the view is, is that we should have minimum standards for road transport workers, that um, road transport businesses will be, should be required to adhere to, no matter what the work status of the road transport worker is. That is, I think the employee independent contractor distinction, at least in the road transport industry, is outmoded. It's no longer viable and should be overridden by legislation. Um, and that means that you have a scheme such as the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal that can provide for standards for both employees and contractors. No matter, doesn't matter how those contractors are engaged, whether they're engaged through an app or whether they're in engaged by more conventional means. I think there's a need for um, standards um, for all of those types of workers. So that's the first point. I think the, the, uh, the regulation needs to be, um, uh, needs to be applicable to all types of uh, workers and the businesses that provide the work to them. Dr. Williams, can I just come in the there? Second. Sorry, can I, can I yes, just, sure. just, just while, be, yep. while we're talking about that? And I don't have an argument, yep. but I also would like yep. you to put some thought around um, that there's also many, many, many decent employers 
who get treated like yeah, crap, they get screwed down. And what we saw with the RSRT yeah. by just signalling out the owner drivers, it led to the big uh, campaign um, and it led yeah. to it's only subbies getting or owner drivers getting, you know, told what they can work yeah. for. So have you got some thoughts? Because I, I know, mate, we've got to do something to protect the companies as well. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with what you say, uh, Senator Stirl. And um, what what happened with the RSRT is there was adjustment of rates for one category of workers, and and the the rates for other category of workers were largely frozen in the award system. So there needs to be there needs to be a much more nuanced approach to adjusting rates, such that such that um, the rates for all types of workers in the road transport industry is synchronised and that it doesn't place pressure on businesses that um, that um, engage one type of um, road transport worker. So that that um, one of the key problems, and it wasn't the only problem with the way in which um, that was implemented, but one of the key problems was that there was no um, simultaneous adjustment of employee rates, and so I, 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 that, that's 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 um, that's my view on that. But uh, you, you know, you may have some 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 further thoughts. But um, yeah, the, I, and I understand the pr the, the pressure on those um, subby um, businesses, especially especially the the, the small businesses who, who were who were subject to that regulation. But um, the adjustment of rates should be synchronised between categories of workers much better. So, and that was part of the problem with the implementation of that um, second order by the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal. All right, Dr. Rawling, while we're still on that too, I just want to <clears throat> get your yep. opinion on this. There is, um, yep. uh, we must not forget uh, also yep. that wage theft in this nation is exploding. And what I mean by that, even with, when we talk about those employed drivers, because a lot of people think the employed drivers, oh, they're on the award, they're okay. There are thousands of yeah. them that are on kilometre rates that are, are yes. probably, and look, there's there's some doing the right thing by kilometre rates. Make no mistake, a couple of employers I know do the right thing and then they have it backed up if you're not driving, you're getting paid hourly, that sort of thing. But a yeah. lot of them just get kilometre, GPO to GPO. They're not getting paid actual kilometres that they're driving. They're not getting paid for loading and unloading. They're not getting paid for fuel. They're not getting paid for changing tyres, fixing light globes when they're stuck in roadworks, heavy traffic jams, washing yeah. the bucket of nuts and bolts. And some of these ratbag yeah. employers even drag their um, overnight uh, their overnight allowance and build that back into the kilometre rate. So there's even that great disparity. And meanwhile, our friends at the Fair Work Ombudsman aren't out there policing it too goodly. And I'll give them the opportunity to say that they're under-resourced and understaffed. And I'll say that hoping that I'm right, but anyway. Yeah, well, OK, there's, uh, and, and, and there's a lot in what you say, Senator Spurl, and I, I agree with what you say. Wage theft is a huge problem. There's, there's, there's statistics saying that wage theft is rampant in most industries in Australia, including the road transport industry. And um, and that means that the employees, employee uh, drivers, are also being underpaid. Um, and I, I think I think there's 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 a, there's a couple of things which need significant improvement. Um, I should just say that I mean I, I might be a bit unpopular for this, but I should just say that I I had a conversation with people representatives from the road transport industry a number of years ago with some academics, and there there was some consensus and sense in an hourly rate for some drivers. Now, um, I know from um, for some drivers that would be unpopular, but it would deal with some of the underpayment issues. Now, the issues it wouldn't deal with, obviously, is the funding for adequate um, monitoring and enforcement. And I think the Fair Work Ombudsman ne does need a bit of a wake-up call about underpayment. It's doing, it's doing 
it, it does have a, um, a, a strategy to address underpayments and it's doing that sort of thing, but I think it needs further funding. Um, I think that it also needs to look at much more closely and there's, there's literature on this, that uh, John Howe and um, Tess Hardy have written about this. There's literature on how they should partner with the union movement to address um, the underpayment crisis in, in Australia and look at, um, look at more closely um, cooperating with unions and unions more closely cooperating with the Fair Work Ombudsman to make sure that all workers in Australia are paid adequately. Now, that obviously means two things. One, it means that there needs to be adequate funding, both for union regulators and for governmental regulators. Yeah, so that's, that's the point I wanted to make there. So, yeah, thank you, Senator Stewart. No worries. So I, I was just, so, uh, just, I was just on my final, the final point that I was, I was addressing about what sort of regulation is needed. And we talked about, uh, and I talked about um, the need to go beyond the employee independent contractor distinction when if, if the, the federal parliament is mindful that there is a need to address this safety crisis in the road transport industry, I think the form of regulation that it needs to take is to be able to have, um, well, I, I, I'm, <laughs> my, my views are pretty clear on this, is to have a tribunal form of regulation that can make orders for both employees and independent contractors and, and, and as well as um, gig workers who are engaged as contractors. So that's the first point about what type of regulation is needed. The second point is that it needs to be a programmatic response it can't just be individual unfair contracts regulation or something like that. What's needed is that you, you need to be able to roll out minimum standards in a nuanced and, and, and responsive sort of way so that what happened last time um, with the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal doesn't happen again. You need to be able to roll, uh, roll out standards for classes of workers in the road transport industry, not just individual regulation of a particular work contract. Because then if you have individual regulation for a particular work contract, frequently the burden then falls on the individual driver to, to litigate or enforce that right. And I, and I don't think that's as good a form of regulation as a, a form of regulation, say, as you have under Chapter 6 of the New South Wales Act, where you can have a contract determination that, that applies to a class or group of workers. OK, are we still on? Yeah, you're still there. OK, so that's the final point I wanted to make, Senator Stirl. And I, I, um, I just wanted to... Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions that senators have. All right, now I'll come back to this, Dr. Rawling, too. Though. Another thing that has yep. crossed my mind, there's been a bit of talk too, and it's touched on today. <clears throat> and I know what Victoria has since done with, <coughs> excuse me, addressing, <coughs> sorry about that, addressing truck yeah, accidents sorry. rather than uh, road uh, deaths, right? Rather yeah. than a uh, road accident as a workplace accident. You put any thought around that? No, I haven't. I, 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 I haven't. I haven't followed that. Sorry, I'm, I'll I, tell you I what, think I'll I can assist you, you there. No, I'll give you a heads up. It wasn't fair for me to ambush you like that. No, and sorry, but I'm. No, that's I, okay. That's what the okay. thinking is, and I, this is what I subscribe to. If we have an aeroplane yeah. go down, uh, there is yeah. a department called the Australian Transport Safety Bureau that take years yeah. and years and years to go into. It, right, and what happened, yeah. and all sorts of stuff like that. If a train goes off and there's a derailment, and someone gets killed same deal so we yeah. happen to kill unfortunately too many people in the road transport industry but it's addressed it's, it's like oh it's just a part of business let's keep going now i don't mm. know too many truckies who sit out in the morning and think oh, with a bit of luck i might kill someone or myself couldn't be further from the truth yeah 
yet like you said yeah. you're 13 times more um likely to be killed in a uh, transport uh, uh, accident than you are at any other job in australia so if there was yeah. with your learned uh, uh, hat on if there was a greater emphasis on it's not just a part of doing business if we've lost a life in a track at truck accident what the hell what the hell happened what went wrong yeah, no, I, 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 yeah, no, I agree with that. But what, the, the, the other, the other thing, the other, the other point there is that proactive, preventive regulation is much better than post-accident investigation. I mean, obviously, you need both um, because there, there, uh, you have to address the reality that there are accidents which cause deaths and injuries, but. It, what, what we have at the moment is not enough preventive regulation and one of the, one of the things that the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal was doing was looking at preventive measures to try and avoid yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, heavy, heavy vehicle accidents, etc. So, and one of the things it was, what was doing was trying to take away the incentives to engage in the hazardous practices yeah. that led to that, that leads that leads to accidents. So that's that. Yeah. So I, I think, but I think if you look at those um, accidents as as not just something that's part of a business model, that's the it, that's the the deaths of um, people with families. Um, that have uh, uh, have a, a, a huge social cost. I think I think that would be an improvement as well. All right, Dr. Rawlings, just for, so I'll come back to what you did talk about earlier, and I'm in Professor yep. Quinn Liven, uh, Quinlan's um, um, backyard on this. As an ex-owner driver, right. uh, I'll speak for myself. Yep. I was paid a kilometre rate. I was paid a cubic metre ridge yep. rate for what everything I loaded and unloaded. I was packed for every size carton I packed, and I even got paid. It three dollars a page to write an inventory so everything i did was incentive driven okay and to yep. me uh, and my mates the harder we went the longer we went the more money we made because we could turn around trips and we could go back again and the good old west in yep. them days was there was no fatigue management fatigue management was um uh oh i think i better pull up now and have a camp and to not open my eye i'm off again and that's how we operated so i'll yep. speak for myself i firmly yeah. firmly believe that remuneration and safety are 100% locked in, stayed together. They're joined at the yeah. hip. I've had a couple of submissions, mm -hmm. one from a fellow Bustleton Freight Services who disagreed with me vehemently, but I gave him the opportunity to come and appear and didn't want to, to tell me why it's mm -hmm. not. There's another mob here in Sydney that I don't even know what they do, and I don't want to sound rude because I've never heard of them. They're not a trucking company who said something about that that's not true, it's not linked. And then I get silly stories yeah. of just because you pay a truck driver more doesn't mean they're going to put, you know, um, put, put money back into their truck. Or something. Oh, I don't know, geez. Anyway, what's your thoughts around that? And I won't be swayed either. I will yeah. not be swayed. That's my experience. No, I, it, it's just a, um, uh, that I, <laughs> uh, I, I've, um, I agree with Professor Quinlan too that um, and, and it's really good to hear from a practical point of view that that's what that's what um, you thought um, and the science backs up what you're saying Senator Stirl the science is is clear that the studies have confirmed and reconfirmed the link between pain safety um, uh, <laughs> over over a long period starting with the Willis report in um, in New South Wales, I think it was 1970, um, they talked about a link between um, safe conditions of work and, and pay. And then the two, then there was the Quinlan report of 2001 for the the um, New South Wales Department, and then the Quinlan and Wright report of 2008, which reconfirmed the link between pay and safety in the in the road transport industry. And in particular, that the low pay drives hazardous practices and cause poor safety outcomes. Um, and there's been a number of studies, some of which I refer to in my paper, and there's been studies since, sorry, my written submission in, to your inquiry in 2019. 
and those studies reconfirm the link between pay and safety and different aspects of that and different the 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 the, um, the, incent the incentives of different types of um, methods of payment and um, the impact that that has on safety and in particular some of the methods of payment that you were talking about that you when you were a truck driver that you that you um that you were you were paid by and and the and the the um impact that that has on safety and there's more papers since my written submission that have looked at other aspects and uh, of the link between pay and safety so the literature is quite clear even the even the <laughs> look i I mean, I, I, a colleague of mine picked me up on this and he said, I, I, I said that even the report that was commissioned that led to the abolition of the, of the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal, even that report, had, to some degree, admitted that there was a link between pay and safety. All of that was, all, all of that was disputing was the extent of the link. <laughs> Yeah. So even, even they, even they, um, even they agree that there is a link between pain and safety. Um, and so uh, the, my, my colleagues picked me up on that because I, I say I should, I should um, critique that report more thoroughly. But that's a job for an economist, I think. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, you can't, you can't ignore the evidence. That's right. And, <laughs> um, and, 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 and I think. Sorry. Yeah. Keep, so, sorry. Keep going. Yeah, no, that's, that was the point I wanted to make. Thank and you. I, I'll say at the other end of the scale, Dr. Rawling, not for me and my mates who could earn more and go harder, but go the other end. Yeah. And we all know, and no one can dispute this, I'm still trying to find a common sense argument for someone who puts up with me, it's some of the rubbish I do here, but it's yeah. quite simply. If it costs $1 to run a truck, all right, and you only get 90 cents, don't tell me that yeah. remuneration and safety aren't linked because something's got to give. Now, whether the tyres go into recaps or whether you don't keep up your maintenance or it's not as easy now to chuck a couple extra tonnes of pudding on the back and sneak through at night. Um, now we've got fatigue all around the nation and there's cameras. You know, something has to give. Pretty simple. And I know, yeah, I know an owner-driver, Dr. Rawling. I remember talking to an owner-driver. And, and I can tell you now, it was one of the big companies. It was a Friday night in Qdale at the yard. And he was waiting. The dog yeah. runner had gone up to take his triple up to Woburn. He was there loading up, hooking up his two. And he came to me. He had his wife. They were running two up. And a, a decent gentleman, hard-working old truckie where nothing went right. If he stepped out his truck in a rose garden, he'd tread on a dog turd. This is how unlucky he was. And he said to me, yeah. Glenn, I do never want to let the boss know this. He said, I haven't paid my insurance. And I tell oh. you what, mate, I didn't know whether to laugh, cry, vomit, faint, give him the money or what. How bad yeah. was that? And he wouldn't have been yeah. the only one, mate. Going yeah. up the road, and he was working for one of the big ones. Mm. Mm. And that, that's that's also uh, the literature also spells out some of the some of the problems that you're talking about, Senator Stirl, that, that there's there's cutting corners on maintenance and, and essential matters because of uh, low remuneration, etc. So. Yeah, those those um, things really impact on safety as well, and they're and they're they're more critical than some of the other things I mentioned earlier. You know, to have your 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 truck properly maintained, etc. So yes. Yep. Mm. All right, now, Dr. Rawling, I want to thank you very very much and uh, uh, for for availing yourself, and I do appreciate the effort that went into your submission. I'm sorry, I was saying to everyone, it was 2019. Um, and that's why yeah. I'm very keen to get the inquiries going. There's just this little clue thing going yeah. around that's made it pretty hard, but we will get there. Yeah. Dr. Williams, take care. <laughs> Great speaking to you. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks for your time. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Now.